Jesus does not seem to care that people remove the roof of his house to lower a person in for healing. If it were my house, I would be a bit peeved. <laughs> I know there were crowds, but couldn't you have just pushed through them? Called out, paralytic man coming, everyone step aside. The detail in this story of the roof being removed is not ever mentioned by Jesus. Certainly roofs in Capernaum at the time of Jesus were not shingled roofs like ours. We have a picture that might help us imagine them. A roof complete with a hole even. The work and expense to repair them probably does not compare to roofs on our buildings. Can you imagine if Jesus were here? Well, okay, right there. Can you imagine if Jesus were here? <laughs> Preaching in the sanctuary and someone cut a hole in our roof to lower someone down for healing? I can already see Larry Sugarbaker and Bruce Kehoe's faces, right? Like, what are you doing? I'm not sure that we would respond well. Jesus never mentions the roof, though, like I said. And later in the story, in parts we didn't read, there will be scribes, uh, Jewish religious leaders of the time, who, again, won't mention the roof. They were clearly not trustees. <laughs> yes, if they were trustees, they would have mentioned the roof. <laughs> but the scribes instead will say, what are you doing saying you can forgive sins? And Jesus will brush those concerns aside, too. Asking the scribes, what's more difficult, healing somebody who is paralyzed or forgiving sins? Jesus will say, it's more difficult to heal. And so since I did that, it is clear I have authority to forgive sins. You won't be surprised to hear that the scribes don't accept Jesus' line of thinking. And we know how the story ends up ultimately with Jesus put to death. And one of the reasons that will be cited in his trial and crucifixion is that he claims he is the son of God and has the authority that comes with it. The friends, though, who have lowered the paralytic man through the hole in the roof actually seem to be more in line with the path of following Jesus than those religious leaders who worry about his claims to have the power to forgive sins and probably more in line with what it means to be a follower of Jesus than my worries about the hole in the roof would indicate. Jesus has come to signal a new world order, one in which human needs will rise to the top of the concerns. The scribes are interested in holding on to power and having clearly defined rules, knowing who is in and who is out. And when I think of the hole in the roof, my worries start to run towards property value, the cost of repairs, the importance of material goods, and stewardship of resources. What if it rains before the hole in the roof can be repaired? Right? We live in the Pacific Northwest, so this is what comes to my mind. So the rain is coming, and there's a hole in our roof. What if the whole roof needs replaced instead of just fixing that hole? Do they have money in their budget for it? Will a capital campaign be successful? I didn't worry about these things quite so much before I became pastor of a 27,000 square foot building. But still, roofs are important. We can reduce the worries of the scribes and the maintenance of buildings down to the least common denominator and pretend like there's nothing of concern in either of these areas of worry. But stewardship matters, and we know that rules are a form of order that helps society function. So order and stewardship do matter, but not as much as human need. And Jesus comes to bring a focus on taking care of people above all else. When we think about Jesus' world order or the kingdom of God, we are called to put people above things, above rules, even possibly above order. Time and again, when Jesus eats with people, heals people, talks to people, forgives people, he is upending the conventions of the time. 
Don't be seen with sinners and certainly don't eat with them. Don't welcome prostitutes and tax collectors. Do not heal on the Sabbath. Don't forgive sins. You don't have the authority for that. Don't make holes in roofs. Okay, that's my role. <laughs> the scribes didn't say anything about that. But as much as we can look at these stories and see perhaps the limited thinking of the leaders in the first century, these stories matter to us only in as much as they help us see our limitations. We might not object to healing on the Sabbath, something Jesus does in the verses just prior to this healing, but I know that a hole in our roof would ruffle feathers. Who is this man that lets people destroy property and then forgives sins and never makes a plan for fixing the roof? Did he ask the friends if they will be back to fix that hole? Did they at least bring a tarp to cover it before the rains come? As is so often true with the Gospels, we don't get the rest of the story. There's no follow-up as far as the roof or the friends or even the healed man. What we know is the scribes are angry, and we will follow this plot line through to Jesus' crucifixion. But the roof repairs, who knows how those come together. Again, this points us towards what Jesus considers important, what the kingdom of God looks like. Friends seeing a friend in need and believing that Jesus might have the healing this man needs requires and craves they do whatever it takes to bring their friend to healing to be a paralytic man in the time of jesus would mean that the man had no ability to have a job or to care for himself this story isn't just about his restoration to physical health as is so often true with the healings that jesus does this would be a restoration to the man being able to participate in the society around him, to work, to be able to interact with other people, to be looked at and considered whole and healed and sin-free. We might have a different understanding today of what physical ailments mean, but when we put ourselves in the shoes of the people in the first century, this healing is life-changing on every level for this man. And that is what Jesus' priority is and what the friends embrace as their first priority. Human need above all else. I would probably expand this actually to say the needs of the living creation above all else so that we include all that God has made. The kingdom of God has an extravagant grace about it that pushes us into uncomfortable spaces where our normal rules and conventions crumble in the face of God's unfathomable love. What is a roof in comparison to a man? Unable to walk, therefore unable to work, carried by his friends and healed. The scribes don't celebrate the healing my initial reaction to worry about the roof doesn't celebrate the healing. But Jesus' response is to heal and forgive. What does it mean for us as followers of Jesus to look more like Jesus, to act more like Jesus, to worry about the things Jesus worries about, to be free from our restraints and to go into the world to love as extravagantly as Jesus does? It sounds impractical, doesn't it? Even as I hear myself say it, I'm already thinking of all the reasons to hold back. But as followers of Jesus, this is the life we are called to embrace. Many of you have been here over the week since Easter as we have watched our caterpillars, uh, chrysalis, and then emerge into butterflies. Once those butterflies emerged from their chrysalises, they could only be butterflies. Butterflies cannot act like caterpillars. Gone are the days of crawling, and come are the days of flying free. So too for us. We cannot encounter the grace of Jesus, the healing that we are given, and remain unchanged. 
we can't encounter the God who comes to us in Jesus and keep our priorities the same as they were before. We cannot align ourselves with the priorities of the world against those of Jesus and call ourselves truly transformed and touched and changed by the grace that God has given us. So what roof is God calling us to tear down so that the love of God can fly free? What obstacles are we meant to overcome so that healing might break out? One place I know that this church is living out that extravagant grace is through our One Parish, One Prisoner ministry, otherwise known as OPOP. We are about to partner, we are in the midst of partnering with our second releasing friend. Her name is Shauna, and in the coming weeks you will hear more about her. We are still in relationship with our first releasing friend, Michael, who I am so happy to uh, share with you, has a job and is rebuilding his life after incarceration. He has reconnected with his 18-year-old son, um, and in Michael's words, his son uh, sometimes won't leave him alone because he's so glad to be back with his dad. Michael is actually the one who came to us and asked us to partner with Shauna. He has known Shauna since they were both kids, and when Shauna got the news that she would be releasing earlier than expected, Michael knew that the support he had received from this church would help Shauna's healing. And perhaps, like the friends in the story, he knows that his healing, our healing, is bound up with Shauna's healing and hers with ours. It feels to me like Michael was one of the friends, lowering Shauna down through the roof towards Jesus so that she might experience the kingdom of God and the love that can come from followers of Jesus. He took a risk in asking us to partner with Shauna. We are his support system, and he's asking to share that support with someone else. We might have said no, we might have been angry at him for asking. We might have said, we can support Shauna, but we can no longer support you. We didn't say any of that. We all pretended like we had to pray about it, but really we knew immediately that the Holy Spirit was saying, yes, you are partnering with Shauna. And so it was a joyous and wholehearted yes to continuing to support Michael and welcome Shauna into our love. But Michael didn't stop to count the cost before he asked. He just said, there's somebody who needs healing and needs to be lowered through a roof, so I'm going to start to dismantle these reeds and make that hole and expect that healing is going to come for everyone. The truth is, our society tosses out the incarcerated like trash. When they release we have learned through our OPAP program that they are given little to no support towards reentry. It's stunning, actually, how somebody is sent out back into society and given almost nothing and expected to rebuild a life and not end up reincarcerated. Even while imprisoned, there are so many ways the system works to dehumanize our incarcerated and cut them off from the relationships of people on the outside. Did you know that each email sent to someone in prison and sent from someone in prison costs a postage stamp? So when we email our releasing friend, Shauna, we have to pay. And when she emails us back, she has to pay. We provide the stamp for her to email us back. But next time you send an email to somebody you love, just think of what it might mean if it cost you to do that and you didn't have the money to pay. And when we send a, a letter to her in prison for her to write back to us, of course she has to have a stamp, but she also has to pay for the paper and all the supplies needed to be able to write. To make a phone call to her children, she has to pay for that as well. The longer someone is incarcerated, the more difficult it is to maintain relationships that can be a system of support when the person releases. 
Our society has forgotten that the healing of our incarcerated friends and releasing friends is bound up in our healing. And the world cannot be whole when any human being, no matter what they've done, is dehumanized. The OPOP team is stepping into that gap. We will be the friends, along with Michael, that bring someone to Jesus time and time again. There were times on our first OPOP journey, I can tell you, where it seemed pointless. Those who were on the OPOP team would probably agree, right, Mark? <laughs> there were times it seemed hopeless. Why tear the hole in the roof? It's just not worth it. But is extravagant love ever without price? Is grace truly free? God gives it to us without cost, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a price. A hole in the roof, the ire of the scribes, death on a cross, frustration, pain, heartache, worry. But what is on the other side of grace? On the other side of the worry and the heartache and the hole in the roof, the death on the cross. Well, we know what's on the other side of the death on the cross. It's resurrection, healing, new life, the chance to share the grace we have received with others. I just want to say this again. Our first releasing friend, Michael, was so moved by what happened when he joined with this OPOP team from this church that he asked us to partner with his friend, Shauna. That is what the story is of the friends tearing the hole in the roof and bringing the friend down to Jesus. It's when we catch a glimpse of what Jesus might offer and we want other people to have it too, no matter what. And the OPOP team, like I said, we pretend, I mean, we did pray, but we already knew our yes. It was more going to God to say, okay, God, we're in again, rather than should we do this? But we said yes because Michael made such a difference in our lives. So our healing was bound up in his healing. And those moments of hopelessness and heartache and worry were the moments when I felt closest to God because all I could do was say, God, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know you're holding me and you're holding Michael and you're holding the OPOP team and somehow we're all going to come out the other side changed by this. Jesus has given us wings and asked us to fly free and lift others up along with us to the grace of God. I want to read these words from an email that Shauna sent to our OPOP team. I'm truly blessed, thankful that I have been given this chance, and I'm truly looking so forward to walking this journey with all the support and love you all have given me without judging me for my past. I hope everyone has a great weekend. Talk to you all soon. My prayers and love be with you all. God bless. Shauna's healing and our healing are all bound up together, aren't they? Can you just feel her prayers for us, covering us with her grace as our grace extends to her? And all of it somehow is given to us freely from a God who's willing to pay the cost so that we might see new life and resurrection. The conventions of society, the voices of the scribes, or my voice worrying about the hole in the roof, tell us that a formerly incarcerated person doesn't really deserve another chance. The cost is higher than we might expect or want to pay to partner with them. We will find ourselves with holes in our heart that were not there before. But the grace of God covers it all and brings healing to everyone involved. This is what the kingdom of God is about. This is what it is to be followers of Jesus. We risk. We dare. We fly free knowing that the grace of God carries us on wings of eagles. And we bring others along with us, trusting in the love and healing of God to carry us all. Amen.